Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Germination Retail Roundtable webinar. I am Germination Editor Mark Zinkowitz, and I'm happy to be your host. Today's theme is Fusarium, specifically developing a Fusarium management plan. We're going to go over what to think about when developing a management plan, especially three key areas, seed selection, best management practices, and seed testing. We have three experts with us today who will discuss these issues and take some questions from you, our audience. First of all, I'd like to thank our webinar sponsors, 2020 Seed Labs and CCAN, for their support. This webinar will be available for viewing within 24 hours on our website, germination.ca. And again, we welcome questions from you, our audience. Please, at any point during the webinar, type them into the chat box, and we will address them when each of our three speakers are finished their slideshows. Our first speaker today is Trent Whiting. Hello, Trent. He is the Alberta and BC marketing rep with CCAN. He provides technical support to members and coordinates local activities with CCAN's national communications staff. <clears throat> hey, Mark. Hi, Trent. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? Um, overcast, but good. <laughs> Yeah, the same, the same here in Manitoba. Thank you so much for your time. We, we really appreciate it today. As our audience has probably heard, Fusarium was back in the headlines recently after the Alberta government removed it from their pest and nuisance control regulation in order to allow farmers access to more seed varieties and cereal research. Doing this brings Alberta's regulations in line with other provinces in Canada. So Trent, you're going to talk a little bit today about a very important part of uh, developing a fusarium management plan, and that is seed selection. So uh, please, the floor is yours. Feel free to take it away. Thanks, Mark. Uh, part of the other role I have within CCAN is I'm actually the parent seed coordinator for all of Western Canada. So um, I take breeder seed from um, all the different breeding institutions we work with and uh, uh, do contract multiplication. So I've been living uh, Fusarium in Alberta uh, very closely the last three years. I've also been a member of our uh, Fusarium Action Committee here in Alberta kind of since I started with CCAN 12 years ago. So Fusarium graminiarum specifically is kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, for me, there's no one size fits all for managing Fusarium graminiarum um, or any other disease. Uh, uh, it's uh, you've got to take the time uh, to look at your rotations um, and then hopefully with good management, uh, you know, crop selection, uh, spring when you can, you come up with uh, a plan to move forward uh, for, for managing this disease or any other one. So this, this is a key one. I've done a, a fusarium presentation now, I think of some sort since uh, 2012. And unfortunately, I've learned if you don't put pictures in your presentation, you have to talk first. And there's not many pictures in my presentation today. Uh, crop rotation does not equal canola wheat, canola wheat. And I'm sure Kelly's gonna have a lot more to say about this in his presentation later. Um, but this is kind of a, the standard uh, rotation we see not just in Alberta but kind of across the prairies and, and, and a lot of it deals with economics. Uh, this is how you make money uh, but unfortunately um, it's also how uh, diseases spread much more rapidly. So uh, you really got to think about uh, additional uh, variety species in your crop rotations as you're going forward. Environmental conditions. Uh, this is a huge one. Um, if Mother Nature is, is against you, you have hot, humid uh, conditions for multiple years, and maybe you're running a tight rotation, um, you've got to be willing to spray. Uh, 
Um, you should be out in your fields uh, looking uh, for a fusarium, whether you've had it or not, you should always be in your fields uh, out there taking a look what's out there. Uh, Alberta Agriculture and Alberta Wheat and Barley have put together uh, uh, a very good website that looks at humidity, environmental conditions. Um, and it kind of is a predictability on what the risk today is. Uh, we've got about 200 weather sites in Alberta uh, that we can use for this. And, uh, you know, if, if the conditions are right, go look at your field. Is it uh, heading? Um, you know, is it getting close to flowering? And you got to be willing to go, okay, if, if the conditions are white, right, whether I have it or not, um, you know, should I be spraying? I, I had a number of uh, farmers and members this year ask me about spraying. And I'm in the extremely wet belt of Alberta, northeast of Edmonton. And you really had to look at, do you have enough crop out there to actually justify the spraying? Um, you know, does the economics dictate it? And that's one of the factors that plays into managing any disease is does the economics dictate it? If you have a, a very good crop, you're probably more likely to spray than if you have a bad one. Um, another thing is a variety that's rated MR or R still might need to be sprayed. They're not 100% tolerant. The ratings are just... Uh, an indication of a variety's tolerance to it, but they'll all get it to a certain extent. And I think Kelly has a, a good uh, slide in his presentation to show this. Crop, crop type and variety uh, selection and actually breeding. Um, you know, Fusarium gumianarum is widespread around the world. I, I was lucky enough to be in China in 2016. Um, Fusarium griminiarum is, is on the top of their uh, breeding list over there. They're, they're trying to manage for it in the United States, Canada. So we're not alone in trying to uh, breed resistance uh, to fusarium. Uh, it's a very difficult disease to breed for uh, because there's very limited resistance. And especially in wheat, you have a very, very complex genome there that... Um, doesn't always pass along what you want it to. Uh, the first R uh, for fusarium resistance uh, was uh, a winter wheat. And if you would ask the breeder how it got there, he wasn't sure uh, because it's just that difficult to breed. So any uh, improvements we see within varieties, it, it's, it's just small increments. It's not great big, huge leaps. Uh, there's definitely differences in the susceptibility, though, between crop types. Um, and I tried to kind of list them here in uh, order uh, of where we're at. You know, with Durham's, they're mostly S's and MS's. So S would be fully susceptible and MS would be uh, mostly susceptible or moderately susceptible. Uh, Saskatchewan has actually come up with a rating where they're adding a little star uh, into the MS's, which means it's got slightly better resistance, but it's still not a full I, which is intermediate resistance. Um, they're working very hard to try to breed it into Durham, but it's a very, very slow process. Um, same to be said with the soft white spring wheats. They're mostly S's and MS's. So you've got to be uh, really cognizant on both of those that there are carriers for Fusarium griminiarum. Uh, CPS for the most part, uh, for the longest time was MS uh, because both foremost and 5700 PR are uh, MSs. But as we're breeding a little bit more into the CPSs, we are bringing I's and MRs. Uh, so we're seeing better resistance. But a lot of those acres uh, that were foremost in 5700, you were growing very susceptible varieties. So um, there's likely the chance for fusarium in those areas. Uh, CWSs, we've, we've seen the most uh, progression where most of them now are intermediate to MRs. Uh, for the longest time, we were uh, kind of MSs and maybe Is, but we have moved that along. Um, it also, CWS is where the majority of the breeding is done on the prairies right now. So it makes sense that they've uh, moved on uh, the fastest, but still it's baby steps. Uh, 
uh, Red Winters. Um, it's a real mix, uh, but there was an ARP uh, with AEC Emerson. So, and there actually was an ARP with the CPSs, but the variety wasn't commercialized. Um, or it was commercialized, it just didn't gain widespread acceptance uh, as a commercial variety. And then with the barley and oats, it's really a mixed bag. Uh, for They're a little different in how susceptible they are. Um, it's much more of a concern, though, in malt barley than feed barley, because any fusarium uh, in malt can change the malting profiles on it. So... Uh, it's really something to watch uh, in your malt barley. So variety selection really needs to be tailored to your location, your environment, your farming practices. Um, you know, you can have the best rating, but if it's a really tall variety that's really late and falls over, is it really the best fit for your operation? Uh, you really have to weigh all those things, the maturity, the height, the lodging, you know, protein in wheats, um, maturity in barleys, you know, all those things, sprouting tolerances, they all need to go together when you're selecting a variety. So where do I find the ratings? Um, Alberta Seed Guide is a really good spot. Um, I know, I think just about everybody's retailer, uh, technical Boltons will have them in. Uh, but I just grabbed a picture of the seed guide. That's a cover. Um, you get into the seed guides and, and all of the seed guides, whether it's Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, will have a rating column for the Fusarium uh, head blade or Fusarium graminearum. This is out of the Alberta seed guide here. So you can find the variety and you can kind of go across and take a look at all the characteristics of it and then see if it makes sense for your operation. And the same is, you can find the same or a similar column uh, for wheat, oats, barley, um, durum. It's all there, winter wheat, it's all within the seed guides or in technical bulletins, uh, usually we'll have that as well. So a little bit about buying and selling seed. Um, so I, I just grabbed a, a, the table one of the Seeds Act and regulations here. And this is the federal Seeds Act and regulations. And, and one thing to remember uh, in Alberta is that the Fusarium griminiarum uh, in the past was not part of the federal legislation. It was provincial. So it was outside uh, the typical grading structure. So you don't Sorry. see any requirements. Sorry Pardon? to interrupt you, Trent. I just, I, I can't see you anymore. You've disappeared. Oh, my webcam is, is moving <laughs> on us. Look at that. Ah, cool. Looks Didn't good. Care. Nobody likes to see the top of my gray head. <laughs> the joy Sorry, of Mark. technology. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Continue, please. No, it's all good. I think it's funny, actually. <laughs> That's a great way to get out of the stream. So um, going back to this, when you see a certificate of analysis, I'm sorry I didn't put one up here. Um, it may not show Fusarium graminiarum. Um, it may not in the past and it may not in the future. But the one thing to remember as a buyer is that you hold the cards when it comes to buying seed. Um, you can ask, oh, it, it's a, a federal requirement uh, as a, uh, retailer of seed that to have a grading report that includes germination and purity on it and any customer can ask for that. Uh, the Fusarium graminearum test is not a requirement for pedigreed seed or for common seed uh, but you as the buyer can ask for that um, and I think the next slide puts it uh, you can ask for any testing you want and if your seller will not provide that for you, take your business somewhere else. It's that simple. Um, in my previous life with what was United Grain Growers, um, I bought, I was the quality control uh, for all the forages that was retailed out of all of our retail locations. We had our own set of standards. Um, whoever I bought seed from, if it didn't meet our internal quality, I just went somewhere else. Um, it's not easy, uh, but it's something that where you have the control. It's your decision where you buy your seed or use your own seed. Um, one other thing, FDK, 
and Fusarium germinarum on a seed test are not the same thing. Um, FDK is what the Canadian Grain Commission uses for uh, grading grade within Canada. It can be caused by germinarum, but it can also be caused by a number of other species that are all lumped together in Fusarium damaged kernels, and it's a visual grading thing. Fusarium germinarum on a seed test is a DNA test and a positive on that DNA test does not mean you will actually see any FDK. Actually, I've seen lots of samples um, because I actually look after uh, all our seed that goes into trials across the prairies. You can have a perfect looking sample of wheat or barley and it may show uh, half or 1% germinarum in it uh, on a seed test. So, um, and one doesn't always lead to the other, but you know, you gotta be looking, they are two different things. So I'm getting near the end, managing Fusarium, um, germinarium, you know, select a variety that meets all your needs, uh, be it maturity, standability, disease, etc. Always use the best quality seed available. Um, and, and that goes if you're using your own or you're buying seed. Ask for a seed test, get it seed tested. Um, that's the only way to know. Um, use a proper seed treatment and make sure it's applied properly. Partial coverage equals poor per performance. So if you're going to use a seed treatment, make sure it's registered for what you want it to do. And then make sure it's applied properly. Um, uh, I've seen more uh, Petri dish tests then I'd like to, to say of, of samples that weren't treated right, and, and you get partial coverage, but partial is not what you're asked after. Seed heavily, less tillers equal less flowering time, uh, which is less opportunity for an infection to uh, occur. And if the conditions are right, you gotta be willing to spray and spray properly. And I'm sure Kelly will talk about painting the head. There's no silver bullet. Um, and if Mother Nature decides it's your turn, it's your turn. Um, I've had many conversations with both farmers and our members and other seed growers that have got uh, Fusarium greenwearum for the first time. And you like, you talk about it as if it's a disease that they've personally gotten. And it, it's just something that Mother Nature has decided it's your turn. Um, you know, don't be afraid to talk about it. And don't be afraid to, you know, come up with a plan that works for you. So that's kind of the end of my formal presentation. Any questions there, Mark? Thank you so much, Trent. Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Again, to our audience, if you have a question, please just type it into the chat box. Uh, before I get to the uh, questions that have come in, seeing as I'm the host, I get to ask my question first. So um, it's, it's a rule, actually. Um, I, I'm interested in the psychology of fusarium, Trent. You you mentioned that you know there's no there's no shame in in having fusarium. It's it's like you say, Mother Nature's decided it's your turn. And is there still a lot of stigma among growers uh, attached to to fusarium? And, and why why is that? Um, I, a lot of it is it, it's almost. Um, and this is kind of Trent's personal opinion. It's almost been like it's a uh, thought that you're a bad farmer or you're a bad manager. And it has nothing to do with that. You know, I, I've walked through the whole scenario with a number of, of members or seed growers, farmers over and over and over. And you go, well, you use a good seed treatment. You, you started with the best seed possible. You used a good seed treatment. You out there, you sprayed twice actually. and I still have got it showing up and, and, and some have it showing up to quite heavy levels. And it's just the way it goes. If you're hot and humid, like especially in 2019, you know, we were hot and humid for long periods of time. Any uh, either natural disease resistance or um, fungicide that you're using, it, it only has a certain window of, of uh, effectiveness. And if you get six weeks of hot and humid, you're likely still going to have it. Uh, maybe at a much lower level, but you're still going to have it. So, Yeah, I think there's some parallels to uh, 
to COVID-19 there. Uh, you know, there's things we can all do to to be careful and to protect ourselves and, and others, but but sometimes, you know, it's it's these things happen and it doesn't mean that uh, that you weren't careful or that you didn't do your due, di- due diligence. Sometimes it, it's just something that occurs. No, thank you, Trent. A, a couple of questions that have come in. Is there any particular variety that is resistant to fusarium that consistently shows resistance in several crop cycles? Um, you know what? I, I, I don't know. I, for several crop cycles. So are, are we looking at tight rotations? Um, you know, we've done very little to no actual work on anything like that in Alberta. Uh, Manitoba has done a bit of uh, of work with Fusarium germaniarum and, and actually what it turns into is FDK in grain samples in some of their MEDVAC trials. Um, but those would be every year you'd have a little different results. And I would say, so the last two, I would doubt they had any fusarium showing up at all or FDK because it's been so hot and dry during the growing seasons in Manitoba. Um, I've seen pictures where everything is really short, strong straw. So I'm assuming that samples will look phenomenal out there. So uh, through all of the breeding work though, they do send everything through uh, disease nurseries and they're screened for fusarium germaniarum. So I, I would think, and, and even to the point where now we're actually having, uh, they're screening for Dawn accumulation, which Kelly, I'm sure we'll talk about, is the, the toxin buildup, where some of the newer genetics actually has a, a MR or even an R um, I to uh, resistance, but they have low Dawn accumulation as well. So it, it, they're better grading going forward. So... I have more of a comment here as opposed to a question. There has been great progress in the SRW region of the eastern U.S. Most farmers now are planting elite yielding lines with great genetic tolerance and carrying FHB1 to suppress the spread. Combined with management, growers are not having near the issues they had a few years ago. So I believe, I'm not... I've, I've read a little bit about FHB1, and I think the Canadian uh, breeders are trying to work that in as well. It, it's just not an exacting science to have it work yet, I think. So. I have a comment, uh, an, an, another comment that the presence of uh, Fusarium infection is is also very dependent on on climate as well. So that's obviously a big factor that that comes into play too. Yeah. Is there any qPCR based commercially available test to quantify the level of FG DNA? You know, I think that's a question for Kelly because that's a pretty technical one. I couldn't answer that one. Sorry. It was either Samir or Kelly, maybe. I will save that for for Mr. Turkington. What about European varieties of wheat, Trent? Are there any that are, are more resistant than others? Any experience with those? So I know we have we are actually running some um, screening trials. Uh, they, they're just like ours. They have a whole range of uh, fusarium resistance uh, within them. Um, I, I think it's they're in the same kind of boat as us. I uh, think two of the ones we have are both intermediates. One's an MR uh, that we've commercialized right now, but I've seen the MSs. Um, I haven't seen anything that's come through our system as an R um, from a screening. So I think they're a very similar boat to us. Yeah, it's kind of the holy grail. If, if you can get a an R to uh, Fusarium, an R to Stripe Rust, um, uh, you know, the, the latest thing in the last couple of years is now we need uh, bacterial blight resistance, which is a, a, a bacteria, not a fungus. Um, it's showing up. So Mother Nature has a great way of just uh, throwing you curveballs all the time. Yes, Mother Nature is a bit of a uh, bit of a mad scientist for sure. <laughs> 
Uh, I, another question, Trent. Uh, what kind of toxins are produced by fusarium? It's a deoxymonolinol. I can't even pronounce it. Kelly will be the right one to add on what it does. Yeah. Dawn, we consider it's the easy part of it. <laughs> Before we start Kelly's presentation, I have one more comment. FHB1, FHB2, FHB, FHB3B, FHB5AS are major FHB resistance genes that most Canadian CWRS lines have a combination of more than one FHB resistant gene. So that's something cool. worth noting yeah. as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Trent, for your time today. It has been a pleasure. And uh, feel free to hang on the line in case there are any other questions. And uh, have yourself a, a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Have a great day. All right. I am just going to introduce Kelly here before we get started with his presentation. Kelly is the research scientist in plant pathology at AAFC Lacombe. One of his areas of expertise is studying the genetic changes in the Canadian Fusarium graminarium population and their effect on pathogenicity, toxin production, fungicide sensitivity, and disease spread. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Mark. Uh, here, I'll get our technology working here. Great. And actually, Kelly, before you get started, maybe we can tackle that question quickly. Is there any qPCR-based commercially available test to quantify the level of fusarium DNA? Do you have any insights there? Certainly, certainly a number of the uh, seed testing labs have been using uh, DNA-based technologies for a variety of pathogens, including fusarium graminiarum. Uh, you know, and if you look at the, the literature, there's ample uh, research that has developed qPCR uh, uh, protocols for detecting and quantifying the amount of fusarium DNA. Uh, we're doing that in some of our uh, wheat cap wheat cluster projects. Uh, Adam Foster in Charlottetown and, and Reem Akabuka Hadar at uh, Lethbridge is helping with that uh, so yeah, there are uh, uh, the availability of that. Uh, uh, you know, that's something that certainly could be used. Traditionally, though, I think uh, right now it's been a more of a, a yes/no uh, in the testing. But uh, our speaker from 2020 uh, should be able to provide a bit more information on that. But certainly, uh, there have been qPCR tests around for fusarium graminiarum for a while, mostly in the research realm. But uh, a number of the labs across the Prairie region have really developed their their capacity as far as molecular biology, and uh, including for a range of different plant pathogens. Thanks so much, Kelly. Very good. Your presentation, feel free to share your screen sure. with us. We'll get that going here. And again, thank you to our audience. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box at any time. Oh, and I'm seeing that issue again, Kelly. You'll have to select uh, application uh, window and then select your, um, I guess, your PowerPoint. Okay. Let me get back here. <laughs> Yeah, when you go to your screen share button and you'll see oh. a little tab at the top, it says application window, and then you'll select, uh, it should say PowerPoint, and so then it will display just your presentation. There How does that look? Excellent. Excellent. Well, very good. Uh, thanks, Mark, for the invitation. Uh, we're going to move through this fairly quickly just to try and stay on time for you today, but... I want to talk a bit about managing fusarium head blight caused specifically by fusarium graminiarum and uh, try and touch on uh, various aspects of the role of awareness and understanding of this disease issue. And that can certainly help to improve the uh, level of uh, suppression that a, a producer can achieve in terms of this disease. Before I get into things, though, we certainly want to acknowledge all of the collaborators and colleagues that we've worked with 
over the years on the fusarium head blight issue, including some of the current research projects uh, that we're collaborating on uh, uh, over the years, certainly interacting with a large number of uh, prairie cereal growers. And then we're very fortunate to have funding from the wheat and barley clusters under the current CAP program. And again, last but not least, thanks again, Mark, for the invitation. Now, if we look at fusarium head blight, one of the things that I like to do is to, to look at the past and see what, what factors have, have come into play, uh, views of the issue and so on. And way back in 2004, Dr. Bob Stack, uh, who is a plant pathologist at North Dakota State University in Fargo, uh, he, he led a, a lot of the initial work on fusarium uh, head blight, specifically caused by Grimaniarum. Uh, in the early 90s and throughout the 90s and early 2000s. And uh, he talked about historical outbreaks of fusarium head blight and that they could be traced to several different causes. So if we look at uh, one of the first things, that was the widespread planting of highly susceptible cultivars. So if we look at the prairie region at that time, uh, we definitely had that uh, at play. Uh, next uh, was the presence of Fusarium graminiarum, uh, colonized crop residue from previous crops, whether it was small grain cereals, everything from wheat through to, to oats, or things like corn, which is also a host of this particular pathogen. Uh, at that time, and focusing especially on Alberta, it's a bit of a question mark. A lot of the research, the surveys that were being done uh, by the Canadian Grain Commission, the seed testing lab, uh, testing that was being done, we're all indicating that outside of southern Alberta, Fusarium graminiarum was, was a pretty difficult pathogen to find. So it was a bit of a question mark there. Uh, in Saskatchewan, it was more uh, well-developed and well-established in the eastern regions of that province, starting to threaten crops in the central regions and so on. Uh, next was the presence of corn in small, uh, in rotation with small grain cereals. And this definitely, if you look at the, the U.S. and the history there, even going back to the early 1900s, where corn production expanded, there was a, a, a corresponding increase in, in risk. That being said, other highly susceptible types of small grain cereals. So let's say things like durum wheat, for instance, or perhaps the soft white spring, class could also greatly facilitate the develop, the buildup and development of this disease. And uh, finally, weather that's favorable for infection. And, and at the time, uh, it was thought that Alberta was a bit different uh, than the rest of the prairie region. At least there was that mentality. Uh, I didn't share that unnecessarily. Uh, the conditions really were not sufficiently different in Alberta versus Saskatchewan, or even in some areas of Manitoba, that this disease would not become more of an issue. Fast forward to 2020, and in Alberta, we have uh, the fungus well established in southern Alberta. It's becoming established in uh, east, eastern Alberta, along that Highway 16, to 16 corridor, in and around the Edmonton region, and down towards Olds. And we're starting to see things uptick a bit uh, in the piece, but it's still in the piece is still a, a, a pathogen that would be not as easily found, let's say in Southern Alberta or even some areas of Central Alberta. If we look at corn, that's another interesting thing. We, we see a continued increase in, in acreage of corn and as a consequence, an increased risk of fusarium head blight. Uh, a lot of that corn is used for silage in some areas. But all, also we have a lot of grazing corn being grown and, and in many cases it's corn on corn on corn, which is not a, a great rotation in terms of managing diseases, including fusarium head blight or ear rot or, or stock rotten corn. Uh, the one concern I have though is if we start to see more grain corn production occurring, that would mean that we have a lot more residue left behind in the field and as a consequence, a greater risk. So that's something to keep in mind and, and to look out for. So if we look at the disease cycle, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, infected seed, if you plant it, uh, if it's uh, fairly high levels of seed infection, well-established deep infections in the seed, you may find that you have real problems with seed germination, seedling growth, and stand establishment. 
if the fungus doesn't kill the plant, it'll actually start to colonize that uh, uh, point of attachment to the subcrown internode, the subcrown internode tissue, and will actually progress up into the stem. And that ultimately results in infected residue. Uh, that uh, a trace level of that is not going to be a problem. It's a, where you have a tight rotation over a number of years where you're going to build that infested residue up to a point that it becomes a significant source of disease. So the residue itself produces two types of spores. One are rain splashed, and those are typically produced on the growing crop. And when you have infections that you can see on that wheat or barley head, uh, the other spore type is produced from fruiting structures or fruiting bodies called parathesia that are produced on old crop residues. And there's some examples of that here in uh, small grain cereals. Corn also, you can get the production of those fruiting bodies. And they release ascospores, windborne spores that are dispersed from the residue up onto the growing crop. If you look at a lot of the epidemiological research in the past, and this would be the uh, primarily in the 1990s and early 2000s, most of those spores, when they're released from that piece of infected crop residue, will land probably within 100 to 200 meters of that crop. The spores themselves also are not adapted to long distance transport. The thin wall, they're colorless, so they're more subject to uh, being impacted by UV radiation. So those spores, uh, as the crop heads, will land on that uh, plant tissue. If you have favorable conditions in terms of moderate temperatures and uh, moisture, those spores will germinate to infect that, uh, that cereal head or corn ear, uh, and it'll progress typically down the silk channel in corn or you could have uh, insect damage in corn ears that facilitate access of that pathogen. So that produces infected heads, and when you harvest that seed, that's where you start to see problems uh, with uh, downgrading due to FDKs, and also that means you have infected seed that could act as a source. So if we look at some of the data from the Grain Commission, and I think it's an excellent resource in terms of following this problem uh, since the early 90s. And, and I've had the pleasure of working closely with people like uh, Randy Clear and Tom Graffenhan and now Sean, who's working with the Grain Commission, has taken over from Tom. But this slide just shows you the percentage of Canadian Western Red Spring samples with fusarium damaged kernels. And um, if you look at um, uh, the period prior to about 2010 or so in Alberta, we really didn't have much, uh, many of the samples of CWRS with fusarium damaged kernels. And keep in mind that doesn't mean you have Griminiere. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. Uh, but you can see fairly low levels. Saskatchewan really, it started to become an issue in the southeastern corner back in about 1998, 99. And as it spread into other areas of eastern Saskatchewan, central Saskatchewan, uh, it became much more of a problem uh, towards 2008, 2010, um, and a watershed year 2012. But if you look specifically at 2016, that was a banner year for fusarium head blight from a pathologist perspective, uh, very favorable conditions, lots of problems with it across the prairie region. So you can see 85 to 90 percent of the samples in Manitoba and Saskatchewan with fusarium damaged kernels uh, and less than 50 percent of that uh, in Alberta. So we're just above 30 percent of the samples with FDK. A few years here, 2017-18, where the conditions were not as conducive. 2019, a bit more conducive in some areas of the prairies. So what about the severity of fusarium damage? The, uh, fusarium damage kernel severity. And this is a, a grading factor that the Grain Commission uses to assign a grade. And you can see <clears throat> it's all over the place. There's certainly some years that are quite bad uh, and other years that are not. If we look at 2010, Alberta actually had quite a few fusarium damage kernels. But in 2010, most of those, and it was very few samples, we'll just go back to the previous slide, 2010, you can see less than 5% of the samples of CWRS actually had FDKs. Uh, the, uh, but we did have um, 
average levels that go up to uh, and just over 1.5. So that would put it into uh, a grading category. You'd be looking at a number three uh, or so, maybe even worse than a number three. So you can see that in Alberta in, in 2016, about 0.59% FTK on average. So uh, on average, the wheat here in Alberta graded a number two. In Manitoba, 44% of the sample uh, of the F Alberta. So Alberta had 44% of the, the levels of FTK. Manitoba was 1.34%, which put it into a three CWRS, even worse in Saskatchewan. So you can see it, it varies, but the key thing here is what is causing that fusarium damage kernel. So if you look at these maps from the Green Commission, and you can also get excellent information from a number of the seed testing labs, and they're, they're looking at publishing that information uh, in the Canadian Plant Disease Survey. They've been doing that for a number of years in Saskatchewan. They're going to start doing that here in Alberta. But you can see certainly in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, the lion's share of the FDKs are, are due to Fusarium criminiarum. A little bit of a different situation in Alberta. Um, we are starting to see that transition in central Alberta and northern Alberta, a little less so in the peace. Uh, but Graminiarum is still not the predominant Fusarium species. So you have Fusarium avenaceum, Fusarium comorum, and others. If we were looking at durum wheat, though, in southern Alberta, the lion's share of the FDKs in durum wheat would be due to Fusarium graminiarum. Now, uh, Fusarium conjures up a lot of concern from producers, and it's important to keep in mind that not all Fusarium species are created equal. Uh, Fusarium graminiarum is amongst one of the most damaging species of Fusarium. And when it's not present, you typically don't have high levels of FTK. The severity is lower. But once graminiarum becomes established in an area and builds and is well established on the residue, it's more of the pit bull type of thing. And that pictures of a reasonable facsimile of my sister-in-law in Regina who has a had a pit bull named Sadie, or I called her Satan. Lovely dog, by the way. But once they take a bite of you, it can be pretty damaging. Uh, conversely, if you look at Avenatium, it's a bit more of an annoyance. Uh, the damage it causes is less of a concern. So it's sort of more like the ex-mother-in-law versus the mother-in-law. By the way, I have a great mother-in-law <clears throat> in Saskatoon. So, And the other thing that you can have, and we've seen a lot of this in the central and western regions of Saskatchewan prior to, let's say, 2010 and so on, and in Alberta, especially in central, northern, and the Peace region, where a lot of those FDKs were actually not due to Graminiarum. So the important thing here is in your harvested grain, have it tested by one of the seed testing labs, maybe focus on the FDKs, find out what's causing that. Do you have dioxin of all in all, which is the mycotoxin the fungus produces in the harvested grain? If not, if you're finding that it's septoria or stagnospor in the dorm or the gloom blotch fungus, uh, that means that there's no dawn there, doesn't produce dawn, and your marketing options may be a bit better. So when you have grain and you're having issues or it's being downgraded, due to FDK, especially here in Alberta and central, northern, and the peace, make sure to have that grain tested. So what about management strategies? Well, there's two sort of broad care sort of areas that I would look at. The first is to reduce inoculum quantity and or prevent the dispersal or the introduction of the, the pathogen. And here, the first thing is seed infection. And the concern with seed infection is that it is a vehicle for introducing uh, Fusarium graminiarum or other seed-borne pathogens into areas where they are not present or they're found fairly infrequently. And the issue is that the fungus on within that seed starts to grow once the seed begins that germination process. If it doesn't kill the seed, it progresses up the subcrown internode into the crown tissue and up the stem. And this was demonstrated by my colleague Kit Quan Shi with Albert Ag in uh, Lacombe way back in about 2001, 2002, 2003, and some work that he did. So you're going to get progression of the fungus. So now you've got a source of infected residue 
but that doesn't mean you're going to have issues with fusarium graminearum in terms of FDKs and downgrading and deoxynivol and all or DAWN. You need to build up the infected residue and, and to a point where you're maybe seeing 25 to 50% of the stems, the lower stem nodes, having detectable levels of graminearum. Uh, you need a, a fairly significant amount of infested residue to have a significant risk in terms of FHB development, downgrading due to FDK and DAWN. Now, seed treatment may help in terms of uh, controlling or suppressing seed-borne fusarium graminearum, but it doesn't completely eliminate the potential for seed to seedling transmission. However, make sure to use a good seed treatment and as Trent has already mentioned, good application technology. We'll move through this here fairly quickly. Uh, overall, the role of seed infection in terms of introducing it into, the, into an area really requires knowledge on the part of the producer and awareness in terms of their current situation on their farm for all of their fields if they have access to information in terms of neighboring fields, or they can go to the seed testing lab and ask, in my region, am I, are we starting to see graminearum building? If the producer doesn't have issues with graminearum, it's not really a big issue in, 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 for some of the neighbors and maybe perhaps even in the region, in that situation, I would be very cautious about my seed source and make sure to use seed that is where graminearum is not detected in the sample tested. So if we look at seed infection uh, and we look at areas where the pathogen is well established on crop residue, we're not concerned about introducing it on the seed. The level of seed infection is not a concern in terms of introduction. It's more of a concern in terms of whether that seed will perform in terms of germination, seedling growth and stand establishment. And here you really need to start to have fairly significant levels of seed infection. We're talking over 10 to 25% seed infection. If you look at some of the threshold recommendations for seed treatments in the UK or organic standards for the use of seed where Fusarium graminearum is a concern, uh, you can have up to about 10% seed infection with graminearum before you actually need to use a seed treatment. Now those are standards in the UK. So you really need fairly significant levels of infection. We're not talking about half a percent, 1%, 2% and so on. The other thing is that your seed testing lab report will indicate whether you have issues with germination and vigor. So you need to look at both your germination report and your report in terms of the level of fusarium uh, graminearum infection. Now, seed treatment is a, an important tool in terms of mitigating some of this risk. And here, uh, again, often it's with moderate levels of seed infection. There may also be soil-borne sources of inoculum, and this is primarily infected residues that are at or in the soil itself, in the sort of at the level where you might see uh, uh, seed being planted to. The fungus can grow from that residue and attack that germinating seedling. So that's another thing to keep in mind, and that's where seed treatments can be very important. Just very quickly, one of the things that uh, uh, we were involved with was a trial looking at the effect of uh, soil-borne sources of inoculum on seed germination and seedling growth in a variety of different crops. These are just barley seedlings, but it shows you the effect of temperature. So 10, 10 degrees C day, 5 degrees C night, this was inoculated, but very little, if any, disease development. So the fungus requires warmer conditions, slightly warmer, 15 and 10, so a bit more infection, 20 and 15, a bit more. But most of the infection is occurring at 25 uh, to 30 degrees C daytime temperatures and 20 to 25 C so this maybe gives you some opportunity to, to look at using seeding date to try and mitigate some of this. So seeding into slightly cooler soils may actually help to limit the impact of fusarium graminearum. But seeding into warmer soils uh, may increase your risk of that issue. So very quickly, just to, again, to try and stay on time, 
Uh, one of the things that we can look at in terms of reducing inoculum, and that's infested crop residue, is crop rotations. And here we need at least, at least two years between host crops. So the wheat canola rotation that Trent already referred to is not sufficient. So we need, we need to look at extending that rotational interval, but uh, I need to be careful as a pathologist, I can make this recommendation, but a producer needs to have a suite of crops that they can grow successfully and market successfully. And, and right now, field peas, excellent rotational crop, but, it has its own problems in terms of Aphanomyces. Uh, so we need to, to look at, I think, developing uh, a wider suite of crops that farmers can grow and rotate to successfully. Residue management, what about tillage? Uh, well, again, I go back and you start looking at some of the initial appearances of Fusarium graminearum in the Red River Valley of Manitoba. And uh, in those fields, and Randy Clear and uh, Dr. Abramson from the Grain Commission looked at this, and they looked at the characteristics of the fields, both fields where they had fairly high levels of Gruminiarum and actually Dawn, were disked, tandem disked in the fall and the spring. So that's a pretty aggressive tillage practice, and it probably was reflective of tillage systems in that area at that time in Manitoba, or maybe just uh, heavy duty cultivation. It did not prevent the buildup and development of this issue. And Jeannie Gilbert and Andy Takehouse looked at the epidemic in 93 in Manitoba. No difference between tillage practices uh, in terms of the level of fusarium. I was involved with the trial in Ottawa at the Plant Research Center with Egg Canada way back in 91, 92, 93. And we had inconclusive results in that study. There's been work out of Minnesota, similar disease levels did not reflect residue cover. And uh, Art Shafsma and David Hooker looked at relating dawn content in wheat, I think it was winter wheat, and various characteristics. And the big three factors were year or weather, the variety resistance and rotation. Uh, in terms of harvest management, that's another uh, potential option, and often it's thought of in terms of reducing the amount of FDK kernels in your harvested grain. So this approach comes out of work done in the U.S., and basically you adjust the, the combine to blow out a lot of these lighter weight FDKs. It helps to reduce the level of FDK, it improves grade, and also can be used to reduce the level of deoxynobolinol in the harvested grain. The issue from a pathologist perspective is if you look at work done in Guelph way back in the late 80s, they looked at the ability of stem tissue and small grain cereals, corn stalks, and then kernels, whether small grain cereals or corn and it was the corn kernels and wheat kernels that were the most prolific producers of those windborne spores. So if you're blowing back those FDKs back into the field, you're putting back the most prolific, the plant tissues that, that tend to be the most prolific producers of spores. So one way of uh, avoiding this would be to look at post-harvest grain cleaning. Uh, or if you look at some of the new technology that's coming on stream out of uh, Australia and a colleague of mine, Dr. Brianne Tideman, has done a lot of the pioneering work on harvest wheat seed destruction in Western Canada. And that's a technology that basically is a mill that grinds up the chaff, any uh, wheat seeds that are there, and also any FDKs that are going out the back of the combine. So that may help to facilitate decomposition. Uh, some of the other practices, simply effective straw chopping, uh, getting it into smaller pieces that facilitates decomposition, spread and distribution of that if it's left in a more of a, a distinct uh, row or swath, may not decompose as rapidly as if it's spread evenly and, and chopped up uh, as small as possible. The other thing is there's work out of Germany that illustrates that earthworms actually might preferentially like to feed on fusarium uh, infected plant tissues and especially those with dawn. So maybe that's why we're not seeing the big impact that we thought uh, 
conservation tillage or direct seeding would have. What about um, reducing the level of infection and disease levels following head emergence? Well, the first thing, and Trent's covered this already, so I won't go into a lot of detail here. We need to keep in mind that the varieties that we have are not immune to fusarium head blight, but we've had incremental improvements based on the efforts of various breeding programs in the prairie region. So we're reducing the amount of disease infections, so the amount of FDKs, and we're also reducing the amount of demand. But the thing is to have a realistic expectation. And if you had experience controlling cereal rust, let's say stripe rust here in Alberta, if you grow a variety with an MR or an R rating, your risk is more or less mitigated. You don't need to spray a fungicide, unless of course there's changes in the, the, the striped rust pathogen. Irrigation management, that's something that can be used quite effectively to limit uh, conditions that are favorable for infection after head emergence. And the, you have to balance water needs of the crop versus trying to reduce the amount of irrigation to limit fusarium. So it'll reduce the amount of uh, fusarium in your harvested grain, which can have an impact on grade or dawn contamination, but it may also have an effect on the extent of infected residue within that field. Last but not least here, fungicides. So it's important to use the right tool. So the right fungicide, so uh, strobularin containing fungicides are not recommended for fusarium head blight uh, applications. So it's mainly the triazoles and some of the new SDHIs that are coming out. Uh, the right rate or level of use, uh, the right time, and we'll talk about that in a few moments, and the right place. So you want to make sure that you target the right plant tissue. The thing to keep in mind with fungicide is that it's suppression at best, and it's not equivalent to the level of control that you may have experienced when using a fungicide for things like tan spot or septoria, or stripe rust. So we look at the current recommendations for fungicides and many of you have probably seen this slide. Uh, the current recommendation in wheat is when you have 75, so the window starts when you have 75% of the wheat heads that are fully emerged. Barley, it's 70% of the heads emerged to when you have about 50% of the heads in the main stems that have visible anthers, especially in wheat. So that's uh, approximately that stage indicated by that red arrow. So what does this mean if you own, if you apply fungicide at 75% head emergence? Well, many of you probably already figured this out. It means that 25% of the heads are still within the boot or partially within the boot and are not protected by that fungicide. So the fungicide needs to be applied directly to the plant tissue you want to protect. And some of the recent research suggests, I know we get concerned about getting in at the right stage, but there's research out of the US, some of the work that we're doing, other people like Randy Kucher and others that have indicated that we can actually go two, four, six, maybe seven days after the start of anthesis and still get very good levels of suppression compared to the, the anthesis timing. So something to keep in mind. So one of the other additional issues when using a fungicide for fusarium is that we need to recognize that infections from fusarium graminiarum can occur over a wide time frame. So if you look at overall the research that's been done, it indicates that cereal heads remain susceptible from flowering to about the soft dough stage. Pretty wide window. The most susceptible uh, stages are typically from anthesis to milk. So anthesis is that key timing. However, some infections may occur as late as hard dose stage. And these tend to be a bit more superficial. There's very little, if any, symptom development. So it's not going to be downgraded due to the presence of FDKs. However, the fungus may still be superficially present and producing deoxynivolanol. So that grain that looks fine, may have issues with Dawn, which then means uh, there are problems in terms of its end use. So getting the most out of your fungicide application, I'll just quickly go through this. Follow what the technology experts are saying. So people like Tom Wolf, so the angled nozzle setup, maintaining good water volumes, uh, not getting the boom too high above the crop canopy, uh, and so on, and, and 
Tom and colleagues have some excellent information uh, available on that. Use the risk assessment tools that are available. So Trent talked about the risk maps. Uh, and now we have things like the Spornado, which uh, 2020 is, is looking at uh, using. Focus more on the mid to latter part of the label application window. To again, try and increase your, your potential that you're getting coverage of most, if not all of the heads within that crop. So again, this, this also relates to the seeding rate comment that Trent made. Higher seeding rates, more main stem tillers, a more uniform target, lower seeding rates, more tiller development, a wider window of head emergence, and a much more difficult target to hit. You also need to look at accounting for leaf disease risk too. Uh, so if you have significant leaf disease risk coming in at, at stem elongation, you may need to put on a flag leaf application of fungicide or maybe a bit before that, and then come back in and do your head emergence application for, for fusarium. One caveat, keep in mind your pre-harvest intervals. Uh, my own feeling looking at the literature and our own research results, if we're looking at trying to address both FTK and dioxin and volanol management, we may, need to, may need, we may need to look at a change in mindset. So a little later application, we need to look at a change in regulations potentially to widen that label. And we may need to look at chemistries uh, that provide a longer level of protection. So they persist for a longer period of time. Um, so we need to, one thing we might need to look at is dual applications uh, for fungicides in terms of FHB. That's not on the label, but maybe it's something we need to be looking at. Of course, we need to consider the economics of fungicide use and the response from the crop. There are ample fungicide options available, but again, we need to use those products in the right way, the right time, uh, the right product, the right rate, and using the most appropriate technology. So we're almost done. So a word of caution when trying to target FHB, uh, talking to people like Randy Kucher or Faye Dokum Bouchard over the years, producers in an area of Saskatchewan where my dad used to farm, uh, so that uh, Melford area up towards Tisdale, Carrot River, and so on, have experienced some significant issues with Fusarium graminearum and Fusarium head blight. They've been following what the experts, and I use the term in quotation marks, are telling them user resistant variety. And uh, again, you've already heard Trent and I talk about that. Uh, the resistance isn't complete. Uh, avoid host and host rotations. Unfortunately, in many cases, that's a canola wheat, canola wheat rotation. It's not host on host, but that rotational interval between host crops is simply not long enough. And spray a fungicide. They've done all those, uh, you incorporated or used all those strategies, but when the weather is favorable and Fusarium graminearum is well established on the crop residues within your field or maybe the neighboring field, significant yield and or grade losses and dawn contamination may still occur. So we need to look at an integrated approach. We've talked about resistant varieties, host on host rotations and fungicide, but the recommendations also include crop rotation with at least two years between host crops. And again, I understand the challenges that represents in terms of what crops I can actually grow that are non hosts so use all of the relevant tools, and these need to be tailored to the fusarium head plate and fusarium graminearum situation you're in. So this emphasizes the importance of monitoring on farm, the seed you intend to plant, the harvested grain you have, and in some cases, you may even want to look at the stubble within the crop. And with that, Trent, I'll end there, uh, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was terrific. We have one more presenter. Thank you for spending your lunch time with us. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll go through a couple of very quick questions that sure. came in. Uh, Kelly, conservative farming techniques like direct sowing should increase the amount of crop residues and inoculum, while deep tillage like plowing should reduce the amount of inoculum. Is this correct? Uh, if you look at the research that's been done, whether it's in small grain cereals or corn, it's really quite variable. Uh, 
And uh, if you look at using tillage as a management practice, we'd have to go back to using moldboard plowing and then following that with shallow cultivation to prepare the seed bed and, bed and seeding. So if you look at sort of the standard con conventional practices that we've used in the past in the prairies, so looking at tandem disking, heavy duty cultivation, those are simply not sufficient uh, to manage this issue. It's really uh, what's going to drive it is the annual uh, weather that you're having in June and July, especially the variety that you're growing. Is it a highly susceptible type of small grain cereal or crop? Uh, does it have resistance? And then the rotation that you're following. Those factors have a much more important role to play versus uh, whether you're using conventional or conservation tillage. And we see that with other disease issues, whether it's black leg and canola, or we've done a fair bit of work with leaf spot diseases in small grain cereals. And are there any strains of Fusarium graminarium identified which are highly pathogenic or infect a particular variety? Uh, that's a good question and it, it relates to uh, a uh, question that Trent was asked, and, and I, I think at this point in time, we're not seeing this sort of um, relationship that you have, let's say, in rust and rust resistance genes in cereals and wheat, for instance, an adaptation of the rust pathogen, pathogen to those genes. We, we're not necessarily seeing that, especially in the prairie region. Uh, and in the prairie region, if you look at changes in the the Gruyere and pathogen, we, we've shifted from uh, the older type of Fusarium graminearum, which is known as the 15 acetyl dawn chemotype of graminearum, to the 3 acetyl dawn chemotype. The 3 acetyl dawn was not reported from Canada or the Prairie region up until probably the early 2000s, mid 2000s. So it's a recent introduction. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have more virulence. But the research that was done in the late 2000s, uh, we were involved with that and funded by WGRF and we involved Randy Kutcher or Randy Clear, I should say, and, and Todd Ward from USDA and Peoria, Illinois. And we didn't find that it had maybe uh, differences in terms of virulence, but we did see that it had a better or enhanced capacity to produce deoxin of all in all versus the older chemotype. So that's been one of the shifts that we've seen. Probably my biggest concern would be novel uh, types of Fusarium graminearum, and there occasionally can be uh, those picked up that produce toxins other than deoxin of all, volanol or xerolinone. So nivolanol is a toxin or other species of Fusarium uh, that we don't currently have in Western Canada that are pretty nasty in terms of the mycotoxin spectrum. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your time today. That was terrific. And thank you to our audience for spending your lunch hour with us. Last but not least, we have one more speaker, Samia Fatima of 2020 Seed Labs is going to give us a short presentation on the importance of seed testing. Welcome, Samia. Good to see you. Thank you. Samia is the, oh, one moment here. Samia is plant disease diagnostician for 2020 Seed Labs. Samia, before we get to your presentation, I'd like to go back to that question we had earlier. Is there any qPCR-based commercially available test to quantify the level of Fusarium graminarium DNA? Can you uh, do you have any insights on that particular so, for us? Yeah, definitely. I'd like to talk about it. Um, there's that new technology, uh, Kelly, you mentioned, Spornado, which uses qPCR testing to detect different pathogens. So we are, it's commercially available from our lab to test uh, Fusarium graminarium spores in the air through Spornado, which will give you um, detectable or trace levels of infections. And the similar technology is, there are talks to extend that technology for seed testing. 
but not available right now. However, with just the, the results of levels of infection, it's not going to do much if it's not backed up with research saying how much, how much um, level of infection is showing how much disease destruction in the field. So I feel like that would come in a few years with more research and data to back up. Thank you, Samia. Samia and I pre-recorded her presentation, so I'm going to play it for you now. And then we will uh, wrap up today's webinar with uh, a couple of, of questions that, that come in during the video. Again, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. I'm Samia Fatima. Um, we're going to talk Hi, about everyone. fusarium management nice plan. As we've all heard, um, fusarium graminarium has been removed from the Alberta Pest and Nuisance Control Regulation this year. Um, so it is uh, very important to manage, especially this year, and all the responsibilities is upon the farmers and the uh, people on the field. Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission has come up with a roadmap of managing the fusarium head blight better. So we are not left alone. We have uh, backup support of everybody. Uh, so the, the roadmap uh, is laid out with um, education, communication, and mitigation as the main points that we should we should be concentrating on. So 2020 seed labs can help educate. I will talk about different tests available to give reliable information. It is high time that we make a decision based on data-driven information rather than our intuitions. And there are lots of ways that we can test and provide valuable information in, at different growing stages. So today I'll be talking a little bit about disease cycle, introduce the pathogen a little bit again, about all the various heat testing available and a new technology called Spornado. Let's look at the disease triangle, I'm sure everyone has heard or looked at this little triangle at presentations given by pathologists. It is critical to understand the cycle. Uh, by doing so, we will have a better understanding of the disease and we will have information on how to control it. So as you can see, there are three points in the disease triangle, the pathogen, the host, and the environment. All three need to be present at the same time for the disease to occur. We will be looking at each of these and finding ways on how we can educate ourselves better. Let's start with the pathogen. So fusarium head blight or scab is caused by various species of fusarium. Um, there are over 20 species of the under fusarium genus, but only a handful are known to cause the diseases in crops. Fusarium graminarium is one of the most virulent species. Uh, other species like Fusarium poe, Fusarium comorum, and Fusarium avanaceum have also been known to cause Fusarium head blight, but not in such extent as Fusarium graminarium. So we will be concentrating, concentrating on Fusarium graminarium today. The only thing we can control about pathogen in the disease triangle is the presence of it. Because once it is there, and when the environmental conditions are met, it will flourish and it will cause devastations. Um, at 2020, we have collected data from 2007, and I have made this short movie, which shows the levels of fusarium infected samples over the years in Alberta. This map is based off of the samples we received at the lab, so please take it with a grain of salt. We start at 2007, and then we see the progress throughout the years. And you can see how the disease is restricted to the uh, southeastern parts of the province. And it progress, as the year progresses, we see the pathogen moving up. And when the climate was wet, the disease levels were high. Coming up to 2016, the disease, the, it was a really wet year. And we can see it's, where it's red all throughout the map. It was a great year for training in the lab as we did not have to search for positive samples. Uh, there were high levels of infections that year, so we didn't have to struggle to find good samples for training. But it was a bad year for disease. And then 2019 is similar with the, with the environmental conditions of uh, being wet and humid at the wrong time, so the disease spread quite a bit. It is important to know wh whether the area has had fusarium because that way we can decide on treatments and those fungicides 
and which seeds to plant. Um, it is also important to not introduce fusarium into an area where it has not seen the disease, because once fusarium is in present, it, it'll survive in the soil for over five years. Let's look at the stats a little bit here. Uh, we know that fusarium graminarium or fusarium head blight is uh, mostly seen in wheat, but you can see that mostly wheat and then durum are affected by graminarium, but there's also uh, barley, oats, and triticale that are affected by fusarium head blight. Um, not as high as wheat, though. Um, looking at the numbers, we see how the samples have been increasing at the lab, uh, we started at close to 2% positive samples in 2007. And now we are reaching almost 20% of the samples received are testing positive. The next part of the disease triangle is the host. And then the previous slide showed how it affects all, um, all cereals. So if you look at this uh, little slide of seed sample, we cannot say visually if it has disease or not, if or if it is infected with fusarium, graminarium or not. And that's where 2020 comes into place. We have various tests available, which will use different technologies to test out the seed and give you information about the presence or absence of the pathogen. Well, let me talk a little bit about the different testing. So the, basically, there's two types of tests, the plate test and the DNA test. The plate test is more of a traditional method of testing. We test 200 seeds for systemic infection. So systemic infection is a seed borne where the pathogen is present inside the seed instead of being on the surface. So the sample is surface sterilized with bleach to get rid of any surface contaminants and then plated on growth media. And after about five to seven days of incubation at the right temperature and lighting, the results are given out as percentage. We can go as low as 0.5%. And that's why it's quantitative analysis where you get the percentage level of infection rather than just yes or no. So there's a, there's a screenshot of plate over there and that's the red, fusarium graminarium is the red part. The other method is DNA testing. So the DNA is extracted from the seed sample using PCR. We will then tell you if the pathogen is present or not. So this is a qualitative analysis uh, where the answer is yes or no rather than percentage, but it'll test a uh, more amount of seed and is more sensitive. And uh, it'll give you information on the surface, uh, surface contamination because the seed is not surface sterilized. Uh, we recommend getting the DNA testing done for areas that has not seen fusarium before because it is important to avoid introducing the pathogen in that area. It is also a very quick test with the um, three-day turnaround time. That's, that's about host and the disease triangle coming up to the environment. Um, there's only uh, so much predictions to be done in this aspect. If the conditions are right, which means wet and humid, the disease will flourish. We can't control the weather or the rain clouds. And once the seed is in the ground, we cannot do much. But now with foliar fungicides, we, you can decide whether to spray or not. And um, so when was this, what this tornado does is it catches um, spores in the air. Uh, Fusarium graminarium will sp spread during the growing season through airborne spores. So it'll release spores which will spread through air. The spornado is basically a funnel with a fin which moves with the wind. It has a small filter attached to the base of the funnel which will trap any airborne spores. So during the growing season, the disease mostly spreads through wind as mentioned earlier. This spornado will catch any spores flowing in the air. And then if you put it at different stages during the growing season, it'll tell you the levels of uh, spores present in the area. So for best information, it is advised to use tornadoes at different stages, like the first spikelets, and then when the heads fully emerge, and then when, the, when it starts to flower, and then when the flower is complete, to get the best information of the disease progress through the, through the time.
Um, the filter is then sent to the lab and where we test for Fusarium graminarium spores specifically using DNA testing method. And it's super fast. It, once, the, once the filter is arrived, has arrived at the lab, you'll get the results within 24 hours. So it'll give you real-time information. And then you can basically decide whether to use a, a fully fungicide then or not. Uh, it is very handy, and uh, this past year, we have seen a lot of uptake in the use of Spornado, and farmers use that information to decide whether to spray. So I, I urge you to use this technology for the next growing season. So summing up, for, uh, for managing Fusarium head blight, we have to follow some practices. So the best one, or to start with, uh, is crop rotations. We all know crop rotation is, is effective and has to be used to control disease. And then you have to start with, use the best seed. The clean seed is the best seed. Use a disease-free seed, so test before you sow. If you don't have an option of getting a clean disease-free seed, use the one that has the lowest level of infection. Since the disease survives over a period of years in the soil, avoid introducing the disease by planting infected seed. It is very important to not introduce it in an area which has not seen fusarium hip light, because if it's there, it'll stay. Increasing seed rate is another good strategy. There are no resistant, highly resistant varieties that I know of, but some have fair resistance to fusarium hip light, so choosing those over the others. And then control volunteers and cleaning equipment will help uh, control the spread of disease. A seed treatment it has been known to be effective, so use a seed treatment registered to, for Fusarium graminarium. There are also some foliar fungicides that, which will help control the spread if used at the right time. The, and then if you use it along with information from spornados to keep track of the airborne spores, it'll give you information you need about the about the diseases during that particular time. Thank you for listening in. Any questions? If you have a question, please type it into the chat box. Samia, at what point should somebody think about having their seed tested? After harvest is what is recommended and before, if it's a new seed, I guess, if you're sourcing it from someone, you have to test it before you sow before you put it in the ground. Now, obviously, knowing if your seed is infected with fusarium is one of the first steps to developing a, a management plan is to know if you have a, a problem or a potential problem in the first place. What is the consequence or what are some of the consequences of not getting your seed tested? So if the seed is not tested and it had, in fact, it had pathogen present, or if it was infected seed, first of all, you're introducing the disease into that area. And once it is, once it is in the area, it'll stay for over five years. Once, and then no matter what treatments you use, it won't be as effective as having a disease-free area. So, um, and then with fusarium infected seeds, we see yield losses as high as up to 70% which I'm sure no one wants to see any year. So what does that process of getting your seed tested look like? What does somebody have to do? They, they bring you the seed and, and what happens then? Can you describe a little bit of how that process looks like in, in the real world? Right. So um, for Fusarium graminarium, we offer two different types of tests. One is a traditional plate test and the other is DNA test. If you want to get a faster results and you're not sure about the presence or presence of the pathogen, you, I, would, I would urge you to do the DNA test, which is more sensitive. And once the seed is here, we'll uh, de extract the DNA and test it for Fusarium graminarium using a PCR method. And the results will be out within three days, but it'll, it is, it'll just tell you if there is a presence or absence of the pathogen. Um, the other method where the traditional traditional pathology technique is used where the seed is cleaned and then placed on uh, growth media 
and then that will tell you the percentage of the or of the infected of the pathogen and then that will give you results in five to seven days because we need we need time for the pathogen to grow and form colonies and then the results will be released on a rosa confirming the presence or absence or the quantitative quantitative quantification of the pathogen based on the test so Mia, now that people are in charge of their own fusarium management plan they're in charge of of getting their own testing done and things like that is the need for seed testing even greater now i would hope that they, it will increase the the need for seed testing because now we have to manage it uh, so every before you start anything we have we we test out the product so i don't you shouldn't put in anything into the ground which is the best available product so i would say test out the seed to see what you're putting in the ground to have to make a better informed decision when it comes time to it Thank you so much, Samia. That was a great presentation. I st we still have Samia and Kelly with us for another moment here before we sign off for the day. A couple of questions that came in. Samia, does the spornado provide a specific level of spore presence, low, moderate, or high? Or is it just a yes, no? And do we understand the relationship between level of spore presence in the air and FHB infection? Spornado does provide levels of infection, but it's more detectable, detected, not detected, or trace because it uses a qPCR technique. Um, I'm we I think we're working on Spornado is a pretty recent technology that came out, and we are still working on data, uh, re, like correlating the information with the levels of infection to the disease presence in the field. So Kelly and more research centers will have better information, I would think so. Kelly did work with Spornados last year quite a bit. I can, I can maybe follow up uh, on that. Um, certainly, we're working primarily with the Spornado and Sclerotinia uh, sclerosiorum, so the stem rot pathogen in canola. But... Our approach was to take the, the data from 2020 where we had not detected as being no risk, uh, uh, trace level uh, uh, of detection being sort of low, a low risk. Uh, and then as you moved up to detected, that would be what we consider moderate to high. But we're, we're correlating that information with some other sport tra trapping we're doing as well as some other risk assessments. Um, there's been a bit of work in the States on looking at spore trapping. Um, just from the, off the top of my head, it, it wasn't, there wasn't, you know, I, I don't know if they uh, found a, a good relationship, but that uh, was work done a, a while ago. And certainly the level of risk that you have is gonna be reflective of the amount of spores that are floating around in the air. So uh, if you look at our current risk assessment tools for fusarium, they're largely weather-based. You can look at things like previous history of disease and, and other factors, but um, we're largely weather-based. So maybe, I think it may be important to add that pathogen component in the form of spore trapping and using technologies like the Spornado to assess uh, for the presence of graminiarum spores in the air, and based on what you're finding, that will dictate your risk. The other thing is it could help you in terms of timing. So if you're finding that prior to head emergence, maybe you're doing some testing, you're curious, or as the head starts to emerge and you're seeing detected uh, an ample levels of inoculum in the air, that might suggest that you maybe want to get into that crop as soon after full head, head emergence as possible to spray it. Um, and um, uh, the other thing is, you still see here, my screen blanked out for a second. It was getting tired of me droning on. Uh, the other thing would be if you're seeing low uh, levels of spray,
a slow spore load uh, as the crop's coming into head emergence, but then things start to tick up as you're progressing towards anthesis, that might mean that you've got a bit more of a window there that you can go in maybe a little after anthesis and uh, try and time that fungicide application with the peak level of, of spore load in the air. Thank Isn't you. One you, sorry, Samia. I, I was thanking Kelly. This is one more uh, that you guys both might have some input on is based on yearly infection data. Are you able to predict future years of FG infection in different regions of Alberta? I'll go first. 2020 sure. does not predict. We are more data-driven, science-based people here. Um, and then we look at previous data more and then we give information where the decision is on farmers now. That's a, an excellent, excellent question. Um, if you look at some of the Grain Commission data in terms of FTK severity or even the, the incidence and in samples of, F, of, of FTK, you'll see that it's very, extremely variable, even in an area like Manitoba. Uh, so there, um, what's driving ep annual epidemics are the weather conditions in June uh, and and July. So it would be very difficult to say uh, that, you know, you had a particular level of infection and that was a low risk for the subsequent year or moderate or high. Um, it really depends on what the next year is like as far as weather conditions, especially in June and July. Uh, not only, and then looking at whether you have the disease there or not. Um, we have certainly looked at using some Australians uh, sort of computer simulation models going back into the mid to late 2000s to potentially predict the prevalence of Gruminiarum across the prairie region. And unfortunately, the models indicated that it would be a problem across the prairie region. And uh, certainly in years where we had uh, average to above average precipitation, uh, we also modeled the effect of irrigation. And again, uh, the uh, a negative message there in that irrigation can can greatly increase your risk of head infections. So. The other one last thing I'll just mention is that I did talk a bit about stubble. That may be a missing piece of the puzzle uh, because in some years when you have dry conditions, uh, you may not have uh, a lot of production of parathesia on the old residue and release of spores or conditions that favor head infections. So most of your infections, if they occur, would occur in the lower canopy on the, the, the leaves, the stems and so on. So in 2001 to 2003, we did some work where we, we didn't actually look at seed and testing seed. We looked at testing lower stem nodes. And uh, we saw some relationship between risk so we had one field in Southern Alberta, I can't remember if it was 2001 or two, uh, that had 50% seed infection with Fusarium graminiarum, probably an irrigated field of Durham wheat. Uh, and coincidentally, we, we looked at uh, the level of s lower stem node infection. It was roughly not quite 50%. So, so if you go out and test your residue, it can give you some indication of whether you've got lots of inoculum there and thus potential risk. But whether that risk is realized is really going to depend on weather conditions in June and July. And final question of the day, Samia, what is the medium used for the plate test? Is it PDA or a FG selective medium that is used? Our plate test will report um, many different pathogens, so we use a general PDA, an FG selective one. PDA it is. Thank you, Samia, and thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you to our audience today for spending your lunchtime with us. Uh, again, this webinar will be available for viewing via our website within 24 hours, germination.ca.
And once again, I'd just like to thank our sponsors, 2020 Seed Labs and CCAN for their support. So thank you again, Kelly and Samia, and to Trent as well for, for your time. And again, to our audience, we hope you have found this information valuable. Everybody have a great day and stay healthy and stay safe. Take care. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Kelly. Bye-bye. Bye for now.